Morning, everyone. Welcome to the worship service this morning. Uh, we'll go to God in prayer at this time. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we have to meet uh, here as your church, to sing your praises, to hear from your words. Uh, Father, we pray you'll be with the brothers that are uh, leading us in the service this morning. Father, we pray you'll help us all to uh, gain strength and encouragement from being here this morning. And we pray that you'll be with those who are not here for whatever reason that you'll uh, watch over them and return, us to, return them to our number. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church family. It's good to be here this morning. <clears throat> I've been asked to just bring to your attention the little communion cups. Um, Paul has asked that if you can, at this point, start to just peel them back so that we're ready for um, communion, so that we're not struggling. I know I struggle with these um, and can get left behind. Um, so if we can, if we can do that, and if you battle like me with these thick fingers pass it on to your good lady next to you if you have a good or if there is a lady next to you that has some nice sharp nails that can perhaps help you with this so if you can do that that, that will be great brother adam is going to be uh, preaching for us this morning and his quick his uh, sermon is going to be in the form of a question and I thought that um, it would be fitting for us to sing songs about salvation. Um, and uh, the, the first song that we see uh, is um, up on the screen this morning is 336. 336, if you have your hymn books, we're going to be upstanding, so you might, be, you might make back to, uh, to see it up there. 336, if you'll turn there, and let's be upstanding as we sing, There is a Gate that stands ajar. Just before we sing the song, I want to just read from the Hebrew writer when he says, uh, in uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 12, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all having obtained eternal redemption 336 there is a gate that stands ajar and through its portals gleaming a radiance from the cross afar, the Savior's love revealing. Yes, in the blood of Christ I see the gate that stands ajar for me. For me, for me. That stands a job for me. The gate a job stands free for all to see through its salvation. The rich and poor, the great and small, of every tribe and name. Yes, in the blood of Christ I see the gate 
sends a job for me. For me. reading from the Old Testament this morning is taken from Psalms number 21, Psalm 21. I'm reading from the ESV. Psalm 21 verse 1 down to the end. O Lord, in your strength, the king rejoices, and in your salvation, how greatly he exalts. You have given him his heart desire, and have not withheld the request of his life. For you, meet him with rich blessings. You set a crown of fine gold upon his head. He asked life of you, you gave it to him. Land of the days forever and ever. His glory is great through your salvation. Splendor and majesty you bestowed on him. For you make him most blessed forever and you make him glad with the joy of your presence. For the king's trust in the Lord, and through the steadfast love of the Most High, he shall not be moved. Your hand will find out all your enemies, your right hand, will find out those who hate you. You will make them as a blazing oven when you appear. The Lord will swallow, will swallow, sorry, the Lord will swallow them up in his wrath and a fire will consume them. You will destroy their descendants <laughs> from the earth and their offspring from among the children of men. Though they play evil against you, though they devise mischief, they will not succeed. For you will put them to flight and will aim at their faces with your bow. Be exalted, O Lord, in your strength, we will sing and praise your power. Amen. Amen. <laughs> New Testament reading is from the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verses 1 to 5. 
And I'll be reading from the New International Version. Revelations 22, 1 to 5. Then the angel showed me the river, the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Down the middle of the great street of the city, on each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamb or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light in the, and they will reign forever and ever. Just sang an invitation song about the gate that was the jar for all of every nation to come in. And this is through the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life in John chapter 14, verse 6. And no one comes to the Father but by me. The book of Acts talks about those who are of the way. And uh um, we can rejoice as we sing about being in the glory land way. And being in the way is being part of the church, being a disciple of Christ. We can remain seated as we sing this song, 535. I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in the glory land way. Tell the world that Jesus saves me today. Yes, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is nearer than the table. For I'm in the glory land of the Lord. To the fall that the gospel will be made. We're in the glory land of the Lord. Wanderers gone home, all hasten to obey. For I'm in the glory land of the I'm in the glory land I'm in the glory land with you. And the way grow with fear, for I'm in the glory land with you. Onward I go, rejoicing in his love. I'm in the glory land with you. Soon I shall see you. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is nearer than the rainbow. I'm in the glory land way. Whisper. God, Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us, and we're also thankful that we're able to call you Father. And at this time, we come before you with the Mendes. Father, we thank you for the, the blessing that they've been to us here in Cumbernauld and the encouragement that they've been to us, and we pray that we can also be a, a source of encouragement for them, Father. 
and whatever they may be going through, Father. And we also pray that whatever problems they may be having, that, that you will, will be with them. You know them, Father. And we pray that you will continue to strengthen them and bless them with good health. We love you, Father, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. to this period in our worship where we center our minds around why it is that Jesus came to this world and why it is that we have salvation because of the shedding of his blood upon that cross we come to glorify his name uh, at this time let us uh, be upstanding as we sing glory to his name Down at the cross where my Savior died, that I from sin I cry, me to my heart was the blood of Church, it's now time for us to partake in the Lord's Supper, and I would appreciate if we can turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 26, and I'll be reading from verse 26 of Matthew chapter 26. Uh, just like Basil said, at this point in time, we prepare our hearts and our minds uh, reflect on what Jesus did for us, the reason we are here today. Uh, for the many years uh, we've been taught, we know that he came on earth to die for our sins. 
And I just want us to look at this. The Bible says when Jesus came and he was born in this world, he was born and he was in a manger. And uh, logically, I think it's, it's rather sad that he is in such a situation. But at the same time, imagine today being born in such a place. We would think that's probably terrible. That's not clean. But yet, he did it for you and for me. Just because of that love he has for each and every one of us. Bear in mind, everything belongs to him. He could have decided to be born anywhere. He so pleases. But yet, he was born in such a terrible condition, so to speak. Just for your sake and for my sake. He came with all he has in heaven. But not just only to come and die, he had to go through so many things, terrible things for that man. He was beaten, he suffered, and eventually he gave up his life so that myself and you and many, many more people on this world will have life. So I think it is something that we are expected to be reflecting every now and then, especially on a day like this when we gather before his presence as we worship him. And I just want us, like I said earlier on, to turn our Bibles to chapter 26 of Matthew, and I'll be reading from verse 26 down worse. And this is what the Bible says. It says, while they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after bless a blessing, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my blood. And when he had given thanks, he took the cup and gave thanks. He gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. And verse 30 says, after singing a hymn, they went out to Mount Olive. Of course, he was preparing for his last, and he gathered with his disciples. I know it was difficult because for some of them, they wouldn't believe that such a thing was going to happen. But yes, it did. It did happen. And that is why we, every week, we stand here to reflect on what he's done for us. So at this point in time, even as we are about to eat from the bread, which represents his body, shall we pray over the bread? Heavenly Father, we come before your presence this morning once again, first of all, to say thank you. Thank you, Father, for everything you've done for us in our lives. At this point in time, even as we are gathered to take the bread, it is our prayer, Father, that you have mercy upon us and forgive us of our sins. For things we may have done, thoughts we may have have in our minds that are not in line with your will and your purpose, we ask you, Father, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness so that as we eat this bread and drink from the cup, we would have, Lord, proclaim your name, worship you in spirit and in truth. For these and many more we ask through Christ our Lord, Shall we now pray over the, the cup which represents his blood? 
once again, Father, even as we've just taken the, the bread that represents your blood, the, your body rather, and are we about to drink from the cup that represents your blood? Father, help us to continue this journey that we've started, that we will continue to strive. Of course, there are times we may fall, but we have the confidence that you will help us to get up again and continue the journey to the end. Continue to give us that strength. Continue to help us, Father, in this journey in which we are, all of us, Father, in the name of Jesus. Even as we are about to come and drink from this cup that represents the blood that you shed on the cross for all of us, that will continue to remember you and remember you always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May the Lord be with all of us. Amen. One of the most wonderful things you can hear a brother say is, this is what the Bible says. This is what God's word says concerning Christ and his sacrifice. And this is the assurance that we have that <clears throat> because of uh, the sacrifice of Christ, we have salvation. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. We have this assurance. And uh, without the, the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, we would be lost. We would be dead to God. We were once sinking deep in sin, far from that peaceful shore. But because of the love of Christ, he has lifted us, lifted us up out of that death to glory. We're going to sing Love Lifted Me, 453. Let's, uh, let's again, for those of us, uh, be upstanding as we sing. I was sinking deep. And sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deep we sank within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea, her mind is sparing cry. But the waters that they need are safe and wide. Love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. Love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love lifted. Out of the angry waves, he 
he's the master of the sea. Billows his will obey. He your Savior wants to be, be saved today. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. morning everyone. Brian is unable to be here this morning so I'm filling in. Uh, before Adam's lesson this morning, uh, the scripture readings are Acts 16.30, Acts 22.10a and Acts 2.37. After the jailer had brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Arise and go on into Damascus, and there you will be told of all that has been appointed for you to do. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Thanks, Ronnie. If you found that hat, sorry if you found hard to follow because he didn't stop between the, the verses. I asked him to do that specifically for a reason. If you like me this morning and you felt a slight draft coming in, it's because the breaker's tripping for the heaters. So if you're near a heater and you notice it's off, let Graham know so they can uh, flick the, the breaker back on. I need another volunteer this morning, but before you volunteer, I have to warn you that it will be very demanding, perhaps costly. This is a bigger one. So think very carefully before you volunteer. If Finley's got his hand up, but Finley was the last one. I would like a different volunteer, but thank you for your bravery, Finley. Anybody else? Emma, are you sure? Okay, come on up. And because of the nature of what I need you to do, I'm going to give you this just now. That's for volunteering. You can go and sit down. I'll call on you later. Okay. You'll never hear a word I say for the rest of the, the, rest of the morning. Thanks, Emma. What shall we do? You'll notice. We've only put up Acts 237 there, but you'll notice that all three verses that Ronnie read for us this morning, and I appreciate you stepping in and doing that, Ronnie, had the same kind of question, sentiment. What shall I do? What shall we do? What do I need to do? And, and the, the obvious part of the question is to be saved. It's is what they're asking. What shall we do? To be saved, Graham, uh, Graham gave his best Peter impersonation last week and preached his version of that sermon in Acts chapter 2. And it gets to the end where he tells them, you've murdered the Messiah you've been waiting on for hundreds of years. He came, you put him on a cross, and they realized it in verse 37. They were cut to the heart. Pierce to the heart that it says, it says, and we'll be going to Acts 2 several times, so keep a marker there if you want. And they said, 
what shall we do? If you're asking that kind of question, first of all, you have to realize that there is a need. You have to realize there's a need. So we have uh, an animated version of, or an animated account of David Nemo on holiday in France last summer. And we have a shark attack. Now, we have one who realizes that there is a shark there and he's asking himself, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna swim like the clappers to get to the nearest boy or anything to get him out of the water. But the lady doesn't even realize there's a shark there. So she's not even asking the question. So when we're talking about the question, what shall we do? We have to realize that there is a need, that there is a problem. She doesn't realize there's a need. She doesn't realize there's a problem. So she's not even asking the question. Let's assume for a moment that we all realize that there's a need. We all realize there's a problem and we're used to, we're used to dealing with problems. We're used to solving problems. Spring's coming. It is, I promise, soon. It'll almost be here. And the weeds will start popping up through the monoblock, Nicola. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? You're going to go out and you're going to start picking them and you can start pulling them out from between the monoblock. We're used to doing that. Spring's coming. Time for exams. Teenagers, exams are coming. What are you going to do? You're going to study. There's a problem there. There's, there's an issue. There's an obstacle to be overcome. If you're asking yourself the question, what am I going to do? Yes, yeah, I'm, I'm figuring you already know the answer. And you're going to take care of that. Your flat needs painted. The ceiling in particular needs painted. And your wife's not available to do it at the moment and you don't have a proper platform. <laughs> Johnson's through the back there. Love, what's he going to do? He's just going to rig up some cockamamie platform that doesn't work and he's going to try and do it himself. But he sees a problem and he figures he's got the answer to it and he tries it and we realize he didn't. But, but sometimes the problem's a little bigger. Sometimes you put, sometimes you put uh, petrol in your diesel car. Pete. What are you going to do? Well, there's not much you can do about it yourself. In that kind of situation, you can't answer the question yourself. You're going to have to call for some help. Ian, your boiler needs a thermostatic timer so that you can control when it comes on and off. What are you going to do? Are you going to get to work and fit that thing? No. You're going to call for some help. You're going to call for a plumber. Your Christmas decorations need brought down from the loft and you're in the house yourself. What are you going to do? Are you going to go up yourself? Of course not. <laughs> Nobody would do that. You're going to call for some help. Some problems are even bigger than that, though. Some problems are so big that we can't even call for help. Some question, some question, some sometimes the question of what shall we do, the answer is too big for us even to call on someone else. Sometimes what we have to do is we have to change the question. And to be fair, when we first entitled this lesson, and if you men, if you've got your worship plan, you'll see that it's not called what shall we do, it's called how am I saved? So to be fair to us, when we were talking about this in Acts 237, and we see the question is, what shall we do? We changed it to, how am I saved? But even then, as we were discussing those lesson plans, we changed, we made the text, Acts 238. So we changed the question to, how am I saved? But we kept the answer in Acts 238, which is repent and be baptized. And that's important. And we're going to talk about that. But it still focuses on what, what, shall, what shall I do? What shall we do? 
what am I going to do? And frankly, and we've seen it already this morning from the songs that Basil's led us in, that's not going to be enough. It's not going to solve the problem. The problem is too big, it's too big for that. The problem is going to require a bigger answer. The problem in Acts 2.37 is going to require a higher power, a greater power. So we changed it to what shall we do from how am I saved? But how am I saved is a better question. Go to Ephesians, keep a marker there if you want, and go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. Ephesians 1, 7. In him, we have redemption through his blood. In him, we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Not anything we've done, not anything we can be through the blood because of his grace and the riches of that grace. Ephesians 1 7 and many other passages I'm going to look at this morning is very clear. The power is in the blood. We sing that song as well. The power to answer the question is in the blood and nowhere else. Go to Romans chapter 5. What we're going to see is a few things about the blood of Jesus here. And first of all, we're going to look at the power. Jesus' blood has the power to reconcile. Romans chapter 5, verse 9. Jesus' blood has the power to reconcile. Beginning, chap beginning in verse 9, going through to verse 11. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were still enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. I love the NLT version of this. It says, and since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. Think about reconciliation. I love how the translators of the NLT talked about our friendship with God was ruined and that friendship was restored and it was only restored because of the blood of Christ. That was the only thing that was possible. Really picture the reality of reconciliation. We know about it even in life relationships, when they break down, when they're separated, and then when there's reconciliation there of a relationship that we met, that we miss, we know what that's like. Think about what it's like with God. Go to Colossians 1, 19. Colossians 1, verse 19. Beginning in verse 19, we'll go down through verse 21. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him, to reconcile to himself all things, 
whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Love the NLT version of this as well. Colossians 1, 19 through 22 there in the NLT. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ and through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you who were once far away from God. You were as enemies separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Think about the magnitude of that. The reconciliation that we have with God. We were far away. We're brought near. We, we were once alienated. We're separated. That friendship has been ruined. It's over. And it's made possible again. But only by the blood of Christ. Again, we all know the joy of reconciliation in our own life relationships. But in this instance, it's with God. It's only possible because of his blood. Jesus' blood has the power to reconcile. Jesus' blood also has the power to redeem. Look at uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11 through 15. And we're, <clears throat> we're going to find, we're going to get to this in Dick's class in several weeks, I would imagine. That's, that's okay. Hebrews chapter 9. And beginning in verse 11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. An eternal redemption achieved for us by the means of the blood of Jesus. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. The blood of Jesus is the power to redeem, and I want us to understand the magnitude of redemption. Redemption is when we buy something back. Maybe we've handed it into the pawn shop. They give us some money for it, and we go and we, want, we value that thing enough that we want to go and buy it back with the interest on there that he's added. We have to buy it back for more than we sold it for. But it's worth it. Remember Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7? Passage we turned to earlier. I love the NLT version of that as well. Should come up there. Yeah, he is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He's talking about redemption. He purchased our freedom with the blood of his son. Compare that to the drama that we know of in uh, Hosea chapter 3, when we're talking about Hosea and Gomer. Go to Hosea chapter 3 and look at the first two verses there. If you're not familiar with the story of Hosea, Hosea is a prophet of God, and uh, God tells him to marry this woman, Gomer. And Gomer decides that she would have more fun out in the world. So she goes out and starts sleeping around and living whatever way she wanted. And she gets herself in a mess. Must get herself in some debt. Clearly then becomes the property of some unscrupulous men. 
and they end up getting fed up with her, so they put her into the slave market to sell her. After she after she's been passed around sexually from pillar to post and probably every other way as well. And God tells go, Hosea, go to the slave market and buy her back. Buy her back. Pay the money for someone who was your wife anyway and make her your wife again and love her like your wife again. That's some redemption. Hebrew, sorry, Hosea chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, and this is where he's told to do this. And the Lord said to me, go again. Love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. So I bought her. I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a letheth of barley. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the love that's involved in that kind of redemption? Imagine what you have to overcome. Look at Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1. Look at verse 12. And we'll read down to verse 14. Colossians 1, beginning verse 12 this time. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption. Remember that's made possible by the blood of Christ in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now here in Colossians, in this part of chapter one, he's talking about in redemption in connection with deliverance in redemption in connection with being delivered. The, the Greek word is ruomahi, and it literally means to draw to oneself or to snatch out. Thayer says this about it as a definition. We move from slavery to Satan to slavery to Christ. I think that's click. No, it's not. Something click. That was the breaker again. We move from slavery to Satan to slavery to Christ or freedom in Christ if we'd rather do it that way. We move from a position of being lost. We move from lostness to salvation, to forgiveness. That comes because of the redemption that is made possible because of the blood of Christ. We are moved from one place to another. We're in a place where there's a problem. And we're asking the question, what shall we do? Or how can I be, how can I overcome this problem? Well, you can. You need the blood of Christ to move you from that place of problem to that place where the problem has been solved. You've been delivered, like Pete would deliver a letter, takes it from one place to the other. There's a problem. There's a letter lying in the desk. Chris needs it. It's Chris's letter. She needs it. Well, what's the solution? Pete's going to have to deliver it to her. Jesus does that for us. Thirdly, and we're going to go back to Hebrews, Hebrews 13 this time, Jesus' blood has the power to sanctify. Jesus' blood has the power to sanctify. All about the blood here. Chapter 13, verse 12. <clears throat> so Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. I want you to just think for a moment about the care and the love and the value that goes into the act of sanctifying. Jesus is the one who suffers. Where he suffers doesn't matter. There's symbolism involved in there, but it's the fact that Jesus suffered. Why does he do that? Why does Jesus step up and volunteer for that? Emma, are you ready for volunteering? Just be ready. Not yet. Jesus volunteers and he suffers. Why? So that we could be sanctified. So that he could sanctify us through his own blood. There's care and love and value that Jesus sees in us that causes him to be willing to do that. We'll talk a lot about that in Hebrews. We see it in Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, well-known passage. Verses 25 through 28 of Ephesians 5.
Husbands, love your wives, love your, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her. Is that sanctifying again? Having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present to the church, present the church to himself without, in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. Christ and the church and what he was willing to do to sanctify his people. And it's anything. He would do anything to keep us for himself, to keep us fit for himself. He would do anything to keep us pure enough and sanctified enough that we can be in that relationship with him. And not just that he would do anything he did. He did do it. Jesus' blood also has the power to enable us to enter heaven. Let's go back to Hebrews again. Hebrews 10 this time. Jesus' blood has the power to enable us to enter heaven. Hebrews 10, look at verse 19. And we'll go, we'll read 19 and 20. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened up for us through the curtain that is through, that is through his flesh. You see, entry into the holy place, the most holy place, was always by blood. Always by blood. Can't happen without blood. Can't take place without blood. It's not possible. Leviticus chapter 16, you can read all the rules that God gave them. Christ ensures by his own blood that that is always possible for us. He makes sure that that is always possible for us to get to heaven because of the blood of Jesus. It's the only way. Look at John chapter 14, well-known passage again. John 14, first six verses there, but really, really concentrating on verse six, which many of you will be able to quote. John 14, one through six. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. He's leaving, he's preparing them from going. He says, we'll be together again in eternity. And he says in verse 4, and you know the way where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It is only the blood of Christ. It is only the sacrifice of Jesus. It is only his death on the cross. It is only the blood that he shed that makes it possible for us to go and be with him and the Father. That's what makes it possible for us to get to heaven. Nothing we could have done, nothing we have done, nothing we will ever be able to do will be able to achieve that aim of spending eternity with him instead. So why Peter's answer in Acts chapter 2? Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Question in verse 37. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We've got a problem here. We've murdered the Son of God. What are we going to be able to do to make that right? What are we going to be able to do to solve this problem? And, Pete, and Peter says, repent and be baptized. Well, if 
Jesus has paid it all. If the question in 237 is, you know, we've got this problem, and if Christ has paid it all, why Acts 238? Why is the answer repent and be baptized? Because although the blood is possible for all of these things, for uh, reconciliation, for redemption, for sanctification, to enable us to enter heaven, it's only possible by the blood of Christ. But the blood of Christ is not available unconditionally. It's not available without condition. First, we have to find and get to the blood so that we can receive the benefit of it. Go to John 19. John 19. Let's um, uh, bear with me here on this passage. It, this is... Um, this is... a passage to enable us to kind of picture this in human terms. So uh, bear with me on this a little bit. Beginning in verse 31. Since it was the day of preparation... And so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with them. When they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear. And at once there came out blood and water. The same blood that makes it possible for us to be reconciled, redeemed, sanctified, and enter heaven. But Jesus, but Peter's answer in Acts 238 indicates that that's not just all there is to it, that that's not available to us unconditionally. We have to get to that blood. Well, how do we get? Well, he let, Jesus left it physically speaking. And for the sake of illustrating a spiritual truth, Jesus left his blood on the cross. That's where it was shed. That's where it had to be wiped up. It was at his death that that blood was shed. So how do we get there? Look at Romans chapter 6. Now we're looking at familiar passages here this morning. Romans chapter 6, first six verses. We want all the benefits of the blood. We want that reconciliation, redemption, sanctification, and certainly the promise of heaven, the guarantee of it. How do, we, how do we ensure that we benefit from that blood that makes these things possible? How do we get to it? Romans 6, 1 through 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Remember where the blood was shed? Remember where the blood was left? When we are baptized into Christ Jesus, we are baptized into his death. Where the blood is, we were buried therefore with him by baptism into death. Where the blood is, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like this, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. How do we get to the blood? How do we get to the death where the blood was left? And it, and it is through baptism. Romans 6 is really clear. There is no other way mentioned in Scripture to get to the blood of Christ, to be associated with the death of Christ. Go, to, go back to 2 Corinthians. Let's go to chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Let's read on. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, 
be reconciled to God. It's only possible by the blood, but we're appealing for that. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We're reconciled through Christ. We're reconciled through the blood of Christ. That reconciliation that we're talking about here in 2 Corinthians 5 is in Christ. Well, we've already found out how to, to get to the blood, to get to the death, to join ourselves, associate ourselves to the death. Here we're talking about in Christ. How do we get in Christ? Look at Galatians 3. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Beginning verse 26. For in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many as you were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. How, what, how do we get in Christ? How do we get to that reconciliation that's made possible because of the blood? And it's still talking about baptism. The blood is what does the redeeming. The blood of Jesus has the power to redeem. Do you remember in Hebrews 9, 11 through 15, that's what it says? But we have to want it. We have to want that redemption. We have to ask for it. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. First Peter 3, 21, the redemption is offered. It's there for everybody. But it's not going to be forced upon us. First Peter 3, verse 21. Baptism, which corresponds to this after talking about Noah and his family being saved in the ark from the water. Baptism, which corresponds, or from death rather, through the water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. The baptism is the appeal that we make. The baptism is our, our appeal to God. God, please save me. I have a problem here. And I'm asking, what shall I do? But really, what I need to ask is, will you do this for me? And I'm asking you through baptism. Baptism is the appeal. Look at, look at uh, Acts chapter 22, verse 16. The account of uh, Saul, Paul giving, a, giving an account of his conversion when he was uh, named Saul at the time. Acts 22, verse 16 Ananias says to Saul, as he was named at the time, and now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins. What? Calling on his name. That's what we're doing through the act, the very simple act of baptism. We're not doing anything great. That's how we make a request. That's how God says, this is how I want you to make the request of me. Be baptized or symbolism that involves the death of Christ and all the rest of it. But this is when you ask, God save me. You don't even have to say the words. The act of baptism is us, is us asking God to apply the blood. The blood has the power to sanctify. We saw that again in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12. But what, what about what it says in John 17? Yeah, the blood has the power to sanctify. The blood of Jesus has the power to sanctify. But in John 17, 17, Jesus himself actually says in his prayer to God on behalf of his disciples, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is true. Well, what we're sanctified by the blood of Christ. Well, we are. Now Jesus is asking for them to be sanctified by the truth, sanctified by the word. Well, what's that going to say? Well, look at, let's go back to Acts chapter 2. And let's go right back to 37 again. But we're going to read through to 41 this time. Acts chapter 2, beginning of verse 37 through to 41. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort, exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word, hold on, we're to be sanctified by the word. We're sanctified by the blood of Christ, 
But there's a part, the word plays in this because Jesus himself prayed for it in John 17, 17. And when they were listening to the word in Acts 2, Acts 2 verse 41, those who received his word were baptized. And they were added that day about 3,000 souls. Receiving the word is going to lead to baptism, which puts us in touch with the blood of Christ because it symbolizes his death where he led the blood. And yes, the blood has the power to enable us to enter heaven. Remember again, Hebrews 10, we read it in verses 19 and 20, but it's conditional. Remember Matthew 7, 21? Rabbi, I mentioned it to me this morning already. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone. Not everyone who makes that claim will enter the kingdom of heaven. Brethren, it's going to depend on our relationship with the blood. It's really important for us to recognize. It's not just the relationship we started with the blood at baptism. It depends on our relationship with the blood of Christ. Go back to Ephesians. Go to Ephesians 2. And uh, let's look at verse 13 and 18. Ephesians 2, 13 and 18. Verse 13 first. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And in verse 18, for through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. But it's all about the blood. Not baptism. It's all about the blood. The power is in the blood, not in the baptism. But we have to get to the blood through the baptism. It's where we find it. It's where it's applied. It's how we ask for it to be applied. That is of no credit to us. We had a discussion recently with someone who says, how can you talk about baptism? Baptism's a work. You're earning salvation. How in the world does being put under the water for a fraction of a second earn the salvation that we are talking about that was earned by the blood of Christ? How in the world does that earn that? Nobody has, I have never seen anybody jump out the waters of baptism and say, man, I'm awesome for going through that. How in the world did I achieve that? How in the world did I put up with that? I must be the greatest person on earth to have been able to do this. All they did was let someone put them under the water and get them in touch with the blood of Christ. It is of no value, no credit, sorry, to us. Emma, how's that chocolate? You started eating it yet? Not even started enjoying it yet? Well, I'm impressed. Well, now is the time of reckoning. Can Emma say that she has done, that was a big bar of chocolate. That was a big bar. Of, Finley's wasn't as big. Anna Rose's wasn't as big as I am. For the last time volunteer. It's a big bar of chocolate. And Emma might walk out here with her chest puffed out and say, man, I, I, I worked for this today. I earned my bar of chocolate today. She's not done anything. All she had to do was come up and take it. By the way, that's all you have to do. I'm not calling you to do anything else. She's given a big bar of chocolate for doing next to nothing. It is of no credit to her whatsoever. Can she claim to have earned it? No. Can she claim to have deserved it by what she did today? No. She just had to come up and get it. What about the guy who was swimming away from the shark? And he swims to the boy and he gets there. And he stands on the boy and he, and he, he, he screams for help and the lifeboat comes and saves him. And he gets off the lifeboat. Man, I'm awesome. I saved myself. Did you see how I took care of those sharks? I'm the best in the world. No. He screamed for help, and when he came, he accepted it, and he just had to say thank you. It is of no credit to him, other than perhaps being a fast or strong enough swing up swimmer, to get away from the sharks in the first place. We, talk, we, we wear a copy on Remembrance Day, don't we? We associate with those who sacrificed and gave their lives for the country. Nobody walks away. Nobody walks about thinking, man, I'm awesome for wearing a, pop, a poppy. I've re I'm really playing my part in saving this country. You have the freedoms that you have today because I wear a poppy. No. It's just 
why we say thank you for the ones who have done that and for the ones who have shed their blood to achieve that. These guys in Acts chapter 2, they have a problem. And they ask the question, what shall we do? To be fair, they come from a religion. They come from a, from a history of keeping the law and solving their own problems, although God had to step in many times, but they still thought they were good in the way that they kept the law. So they come from a culture of what can we do? We do as well sometimes. So they ask the question, what shall we do when it should have been, how am I saved? How can I be saved? How is this problem going to be sorted? Because I can't do anything about it. Look at Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, beginning in verse 4. Let's read through verse 8. When the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of our works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of re regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Understanding just how dependent we were on the blood of Christ enables us to be as grateful as we need to be. Before we were Christians, understanding, man, I can't solve this. I need the blood of Jesus. I'm going to ask God to save me. He's going to apply that blood when I, when I identify with Jesus' death and baptism. And I'm just going to say thank you. Understanding just how much I need that, and it's nothing that I can do on my own, that's going to make me as grateful as I need to be as I become a Christian. But go to 1 John chapter 1 as we finish up here. 1 John 1, 7 through 9. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. There's Greek ten tenses in there that talk about continues to cleanse. It's still, guess what? Still all about the blood. Still all about the blood. You have to stay in contact with it, but it's the power still all there. Still cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth's not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Brethren, it's not just about realizing how much we needed the blood of Christ. Great, you did well at re recognizing that and identifying with Jesus in his death and reaching the blood as you asked for him to save you in baptism. We have to realize that we still need the blood of Christ. It's not going to be about what we do. That will help us stay in contact, but the power is still in the blood. We still need it. We still will need to be grateful for it. We still need to stay right because of it. We still need the forgiveness that only the blood of Christ provides. If we are Christians here this morning, we need to walk in a way, as, first, as John tells us here, we need to walk, up, walk in a way that stays in the blood. Well done for recognizing we needed it, but walk in a way that stays in it. If we're not Christians this, this, af this afternoon, will we call on him to save us? Will we call on him and appeal to him and ask him to apply the blood of Christ to us as we ask him through the waters of baptism? It's going to be demanding. It's going to be costly. But it's already been done and it's already been paid. So I said to Emma, she came forward with the chocolate. But everything that had to be done was already done. Chocolate's already paid for. Nothing else is required. It's going to be the same when it comes to something much, much greater when we're talking about our salvation. It's already been done. It's already been paid for by the blood of Christ. All you have to do is come and take it. Good way. Thank you, Brother Adam, for that very encouraging lesson. And as Brother Adam answered the question of how am I saved, uh, 
going into scripture, there was there was no doubt at all. There was no ifs, buts, or maybes. Every question was answered with confidence. We can have complete and utter confidence in God's promise that he's given to us of salvation in Christ Jesus. Uh, what a wonderful assurance that we have. Um, so I've got one question for Emma. Are you going to share that big chocolate with your friend? Uh, I get it. I've got I've got an approval. I've got a lot of uh, uh, yes. Um, we are going to sing uh, Romans chapter eight verses one and two. Um, uh, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Um, hymn number four hundred thirty-seven. We can remain seated for this uh, for this song. I don't know if if any of you are familiar with this song. Um, we sing the first stanza through twice. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, um, and then we sing the the following two stanzas, and then we'll sing the song through twice. Okay, if you don't know it, pick it up as very very easily. All right. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ has set me free from the law of sin and death. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ has set me free from the law of sin and death. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Caleb and I have started going through the book of Luke. And when we reach Luke chapter 7, we see that Jesus comes across a centurion that is desperate for his help. This centurion has a servant that's unwound. So we see that this is a man that obviously has a lot of respect for the people um, that worked for him. And we see that because not only that is he has some of the rulers of Jerusalem go up on his behalf to ask for his help. And when Jesus on, is on his way there, he then sends other people out. He says, because you, you're not worthy to come under my roof even though this man was a man of respect, a man that was in charge of a hundred soldiers. But, and when Jesus heard this, he praised him for his faith, but he said, yes, he will be healed. And, and the servant was made well. And then we see after that, we see then he goes into a town called Nain and he sees another person that is desperately unhappy. This time it's a widow. So it's a, so therefore she's already lost her husband, but now we see she has just one son and he's died. 
And we know that often they relied on their sons when their husbands went to bring in a living for them. So she was in a she was in a state that wasn't nice. We know when we've seen funeral processions how sad people are. But Jesus, Jesus again seeing the situation intervenes and says his heart went out to her. <coughs> and he made her well. He made he raised the man from the dead so he could once again look after his mother. And then later on, at the end of the chapter, we also see another picture. And here he is now, he's been invited to the house of a Pharisee to eat with them. And while they're there, this woman comes in, who again is best, desperately unhappy and is very much in need. And there she is, she's at his feet. Fire her eyes out and using her tears to wash Jesus' feet kissing his feet and then anointing his feet with oil. And we see that the Pharisees indignant. Now, do you know what kind of woman this is? And of course, he acknowledges and knows exactly who she is and exactly what she needs. And he says to her, your sins are forgiven. See, it makes, it makes no difference who we are, whether we are a respected person of a community, whether we are a person that is seen as perhaps the lowest of the low, as that woman would have been seen. But each one of us needs Jesus, and he provides us with our needs. I want to read the words of a, a song. It says, He giveth more grace as our burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength as our labours increase. To added afflictions, he addeth his mercy. To multiplied trials, he multiplies peace. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, and we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's all given is only begun. Fear not that I shall exceed his provision, our God ever yearns his resource to share. Lean hard on the arm everlasting prevailing. The Father, both thee and thy load, will upbear. His love has no limits, his grace has no measure, his power no boundary known unto men. For, our, for out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. When those of us who know Jesus see his great giving, why would any of us want to withhold even one penny? Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have such a forgiving God, one that sees all our needs and provides everything we need. That whatever part of society we live in, in whatever position we find ourselves in, you are ever with us, and ever watching over us and looking, looking over us. We thank you for this, and we ask that we always remember to give back to you with every opportunity that you have in order to help bring that, that love and that giving to all the people around us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, Brother Pete. The beautiful song that you just quoted there. I want to remember the name of the writer. I think it was Anna, Anna Flint, yeah? Really badly riddled with arthritis at a young age. And she was somebody who just loved the Lord. And uh, that was what came from her. Um, and just wanted to be with God. Um, and uh, again, showed the confidence that a Christian can have through the blood of Christ of salvation. Um, Brother Adam has, has chosen hymn number 902, What Can Wash Away Our Sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Let's be upstanding as we sing um, this hymn and remain upstanding for the closing prayer. <clears throat> what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, gracious is the Lord. That makes me want to the song. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my heart and this I see. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Morning, church. I've been asked to do a wee prayer for a fireman that died um, last week. It's for his family. I'm just going to start with that whilst before I go into the main prayer. Lord God in heaven, please be with the family that's lost their husband through his, his, his act of bravery. He died of his wounds. Lord God, please be with the family. Be, please give them strength to get through this ordeal. Please, Lord God in heaven, we ask you this in the glorious name of the Lord Jesus. Lord God, we come to you. Your salvation, to, you gave us salvation, Lord, through your, Jesus, through your blood dying on the cross, shedding your blood for us. Lord God, we need to remember this throughout, throughout this week. As you know, Lord, life gets in the way from getting to you sometimes. And sometimes 
we lose it. Sometimes we we forget to go to you in prayer. Sometimes we we, we pick up scripts because because of some way that we lose it, Lord God. We think we can do better. I'd like to read a wee poem, Lord, to the church. Just, it's a sentence I'm going to read. And it says, I said to a man who stood at the gate of the year, give me a light that I may tread safely into the unknown. And he replied, go into the darkness and put your hand into the hand of God that you shall be better so so sorry into the hand of God that shall be to you better than a light and safer than a known way. That we couple of sentences says to us that we need to trust totally in the Lord. When things get in the way, we need to put these things aside, Lord, and turn to you. Sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we rely on our strengths to get past difficult situations. And sometimes it's hard, Lord, but we need to totally put our trust in you. We need to totally put our hand out there into a dark world and draw people close, allow us to draw people close to you. Lord God, please be with each and every one of us today as we leave here, as we go into the world, as we go into the workforce, as we, as we go to our families, as we go into uh, schools, colleges. Please be with each and every one of us and give us the strength that we need to be to do what you want us to do. Please allow us to bend to you, Lord, and remember that you're on our side and you are the strength, you are the way, you are the knowledge, and through you can we only hope to survive this week. Lord God, we ask you this in the glorious name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. <clears throat>